Hello, everyone. Please be seated. Welcome, faculty, staff, friends, family. I'm really glad to see you for our fifth annual Faculty Awards Convocation. For the visitors in the group, I'm Gail Davis. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs here. Welcome to all of you. In the midst of all the rush of our lives, it's wonderful that we're taking a moment here to just stop, put on our clothes here, and put on our regalia, welcome you to this auditorium in order to think about and appreciate the wonderful things that happen here at Grand Valley every day. We have excellent teaching going on in and outside of the classroom significant scholarship that advances our profession and helps society in many ways, inspiring mentoring for students so they can successfully go along their academic way, and dedicated service to the campus and our larger community that contributes to the richness of life and intellectual advancement here in our area. It's a lot to celebrate, and so we shall. Nice to have you all here. First, before we get really into our ceremony, there are some people here I'd like to acknowledge. It takes quite a lot of work to put together this event, as you might imagine. So let me thank two of the people with whom I have the pleasure of working daily. Linda Stratton, and Linda's over here in the, on the side, who has done a lot of the logistical detail work for this event, and Mary Albright, over on this side. Oh, they're twins. They're <laughs> bookends. Very good. <laughs> Mary, who actually helped conceive of the idea behind this convocation and has helped make it happen for all these years now, four years plus one. Thank you both. It's a pleasure to work with you, of course. Thanks also to institutional marketing and to news and information services. They helped produce all of the materials and the video that's been running showing the accomplishments of our 2011 uh, faculty achievements. They were taken straight from the pages of the forum, so they include a lot, but probably not all, of the wonderful work that's going on on our campus. So thank you to them. Our processional today included our academic college deans, the library dean, and our grad dean, our directors of the Pew Faculty Teaching and Learning Center and the Center for Scholarly and Creative Excellence, all here to help us celebrate today. Thanks for being here, too. As you know, today we're going to honor longstanding faculty colleagues, as well as those who were chosen for University Awards for Excellence this year. But before we turn to the individual awards, I do want to take a minute to just say Thank you to all of the faculty. You are the absolute centerpiece of this university. Though we are officially celebrating specific milestone years at Grand Valley today, at this ceremony, I hope that you all understand, whether you've been here for a month, six months, or a really long time, how very valued you are by this university. So, whether you've been here for a short or a long time, these milestone awards relate to you as well. And though today we also are highlighting those specific individuals who are receiving the 2011-12 Awards for Excellence, the fact that we have these awards that we give yearly is just a bit of evidence of the very high regard in which we hold faculty work itself work achieved by each and all of our colleagues all the time. So think of them as symbolic, and this year's award winners will celebrate individually. Thanks for being such dedicated, excellent faculty. Without getting mushy, I just want to say that you are faculty to make anyone proud. It is really easy to be your advocate or your cheerleader, or somebody like that. It is wonderful to have such a dedicated group of people to work with, and to make this university absolutely the best. So thank you, all of you. 
let's move on to our program. And first, we will talk about the milestone celebrations. Excuse me a moment while I move three bottles of water on the podium here. Okay, all right, now I think I'm all set. <clears throat> These faculty that we're going to recognize now are celebrating milestones in their careers at Grand Valley from 25 years to, four, to the 35, excuse me, 40 year milestone. What I'd like to do is have everyone who's going to receive a, a milestone award, please come up on the stage. If you come up on those stairs and just line up right here, we'll talk about you while you walk. <clears throat> especially at a place like ours where change has been dramatic over all of these years. These faculty have been able to continue to contribute all along the way to the Grand Valley we now know. It has developed into one of the largest master's universities in the Midwest, with standing among the top of the comprehensive institutions in the state in terms of student profile, facilities on our campuses, and commitment of its faculty, staff, and community. I have often envied you, in fact, the long view you've had of this place, because if the last 10 years have meant anything like the first 40 other years, it must have been exciting and challenging to be here. It's very fun. Thanks to each of you for the many contributions you've made to our work, for the commitment you've made for a very long time now to the university as a whole and to each of your students. I'd like to ask President Haas and Mary to come up. Mary is up here, good. <laughs> President Haas, would you join me on stage, please, to help thank these faculty for their years of service. First, I will present the 25, years of, 25 year awards. To commemorate this milestone, we have our traditional 25 year medallion for each of our seven honorees. You'll see the awardees in your program booklet. If you look on page six, they start there. And you'll see that each person's development through the faculty ranks and including any administrative official post you've held, those are also there. <clears throat> these official data points, though, only tell a little bit about the careers of these faculty members. There is more to these colleagues than appears in print. So I'm going to give you a little snippet about each one of them as we go along. It's really just too hard to resist. So as I read your name, would you please come up to the podium? These are the 25-year awards now. Todd Carlson, Professor of Chemistry. Todd. I guess chemistry can be useful in many ways. A little known fact about Todd. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm not so sure about the president, but he probably uses it too. Todd, on the other hand, makes beer. So, as an expert brewer, I would just have to say cheers. Thanks, Todd, for everything. Cynthia Koviak, please come forward. <laughs> Cynthia is professor of nursing, as I'm sure you all know. She could be known as one of the founding faculty of our graduate curriculum processes across the university. She was the first chairperson for Grand Valley's Grad Council, she served as the council's co-chair and in addition was chair of the grad council curriculum subcommittee for a number of years as all of these structures were being developed. Thank you for all that work. <laughs> James Good. Jim Good, Professor of History. 
I've heard that you can often find Jim running the track and practicing his sprints in the field house. The other thing I've heard is that Jim will break into song in the department office at any given moment if the spirit moves him. So my question for you now is whether you ever run and sing at once. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Johnson. Paul is a professor of engineering, and he's one of the founding faculty members of our engineering program. He's been part of the growth in programs, curriculum, student enrollment, recruitment and so on, and facilities from added classrooms to helping to plan a whole new engineering building. He's been at the heart of it all. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Margulis. Steve wants to know if this is a medallion or a target on his chest here. <laughs> Steve is professor of management, and though we designate you in that, in that slot in academia here in the management department, he also remains a social psychologist at heart and has done lots of work, a very impressive body of work on the area of privacy, which is an emerging critical issue in the workplace. So a good combination of contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next awards are 30-year awards. Um, these people will receive, <coughs> pardon me, these people will receive a stole that goes around the academic regalia of, to commemorate this milestone. It's intended to wear for our formal ceremonies, but I guess they could wear it to class as well. <laughs> White satin emblazoned with the GVSU seal. We hope you'll enjoy wearing it with well-deserved pride of accomplishment. Patricia Matthews, please come up. Patricia is an assistant professor of biology. I'm guessing that there aren't many academic departments that can boast that they have a fire mom. Got that fire mom in their midst. Based upon Pat's many years of exemplary service as a firefighter, safety officer, and paramedic for the Conklin and Kent City Volunteer Fire Departments, Pat has earned the title of fire mom and proudly displays this appellation on her car's license plate. <laughs> Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> Sandra Fortko. She's going to model, just a minute. And she dances. Sandra is a professor of psychology, of course. I understand that she is a power knitter <laughs> and that nothing is too big or too small for her to make. She is kindly, kindly referred to as the Madame Defarge of the psych department. <laughs> Do you know Madame Defarge? She used to knit secret names in her knitting. Okay, for well, people said, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. David Rathbun is on sabbatical and unable to be here, so I still am going to say a few words about him. Before joining Grand Valley, David gained a really unique experiential education. He was an apprentice for five years with really world-renowned color photographer Elliot Porter before coming to Grand Valley. What better way to develop his talent, which has grown to be quite significant in his career, 
than to work with this photographer and open himself up to many varied experiences and interests. Really fascinating background. So thank you, David. Okay, the 35-year milestone is commemorated with a small silver lapel pin with a Laker blue sapphire in the center of the Grand Valley logo. We envision this being worn with academic regalia or on a, a lapel. Our one awardee this year is Doug Kinchy, professor, university professor of mathematics and philosophy. Unfortunately, he's teaching this afternoon and can't be with us, so there you go. But one thing that we may not know about Doug that I thought I would mention is, did you know that in 1978, he was instrumental in securing the very first $1 million donation to Grand Valley from businessman and entrepreneur Russell Kirchhoff? Wow. Yay. He's had a great history here, as you know, in many different ways. So sorry he can't be with us. And that leaves our one lone 40-year awardee. Or John, please come up. The 40-year awardees get little gold lapel pins, but they have a Laker white diamond in the middle. It's huge. It's like five carats. <laughs> We, again, envision this being worn on a lapel or whatever. John, aren't you excited? I'm excited. <laughs> John Rifle, professor of economics, of course. John's history also includes a wonderful first. In 1978, he received Grand Valley's first federal grant from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development for $30,000. John worked, yay! <laughs> John worked collaboratively with the Kent County Health Department, the Grand Rapids Police Department, and the U.S. Census Bureau, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development all together on this grant. But at that time, Grand Valley had no idea how to accept or administer a grant from the federal government. So, <laughs> Everyone basically had to learn by doing. It probably makes you shudder, Bob, as you think about it. It's hard to imagine, given all the regulations we have to follow now, that this could have even happened. But a great contribution to our history, John. Thank you. These faculty careers taken together represent, we do this every year, 330 years of service to Grand Valley State University. Please join me in congratulating all of them for these milestone moments and for helping make Grand Valley history. Moving on in our program, it's time to present our Awards for Excellence from the CSCE and the Faculty Teaching and Learning Center to come soon. Um, first, Bob Smart, would you please come forward, Executive Director of the Center for Scholarly and Creative Excellence. While you're coming up, I'd like to thank Bob for the excellent job he's doing as the executive director, the founding director of this center, and now in developing its policies, its opportunities for faculty and support. I look forward to his continued good work and to the new innovative projects that he keeps bringing to my office for our campus. He's just doing a great job. Thank you for that, Bob. If I could have the CSCE award winners come up, please. As they come up, um, I'd like to say that I have a, it's a, it's a great honor and privilege to, um, to discuss and recognize their um, accomplishments this evening. These, these colleagues here serve as role models, championing 
the importance of scholarship as a vital aspect of the mission of the university. So let's start off with our distinguished um, early career scholar award winners. Caitlin. We'll get this right. <laughs> <laughs> Assistant Professor Caitlin Horrocks uh, joined Grand Valley State University in 2008. She's an accomplished writer with works appearing in The New Yorker and The Best American Short Stories 2011. She's received numerous awards, including the Pimpton Prize and is known for one of the best young writers in the country. Caitlin models the creative excellence, dedication, and drive necessary for, to propel her to the top of her field. It is a pleasure to present her with the Distinguished Early Career Scholar Award. Caitlin. <laughs> Jonathan Nicole. In 2009, Jonathan Nicole joined Grand Valley State's music department. Musician, scholar, and instructor, Jonathan is an accomplished performer with almost an endless list of performances and has taken GVSU's saxophone studio to a never before seen level of excellence. His artistic and creative endeavors have international appeal and renown. For his dedication not only to his music, but for the advancement of others, it is an honor to present Jonathan Nickel the Distinguished Early Career Scholar Award. Glenn. Congratulations, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Glenn Valdez, Assistant Professor of Psychology, has been with Grand Valley since 2006. In his time with us, he has conducted research on addiction and pain control. His timely and important work is recognized for its relevance on regional, national, and international levels. As a recipient of an NIH R15, R15 award, Glenn is helping determine ways for long-term management of alcoholism. For his knowledge, his dedication, inquisitiveness, and his superior research work and ethics, Dr. Valdez is worthy of the recipient of the Distinguished Early Career Scholar Award. <laughs> the next two awards um, involve undergraduate mentoring awards, and the first one is Dr. Felix Nagasa. Dr. Felix Nagasa is an associate professor of chemistry, having joined Grand Valley State University in 2004. Felix approaches his mentoring his students as a calling and an integral part of his commitment to his field and to our university. The philosophy of my research mentorship, he writes, is to empower my students through hands-on self-discovery. And that philosophy has cultivated excellence in our students involving them in research, peer-reviewed articles, conference presentations, with a number of these students continuing on to get their PhD or their MD in, in a medical field. It is with this dedication to our students' learning and scholarship that we recommend and award Dr. Uh, Dr. Nagasa for the Distinguished Undergraduate Mentoring Award. Christine Smith. <clears throat> Professor of Psychology, Christine Smith, is as dedicated to her student scholarship as she is to her own. Mentoring is central to Christine's, uh, as she credits her success as her scholar directly to her mentoring she received as a first generation student. Christine's pay it forward approach inspires both students and colleagues and empowers them to excel as she has co-authored 30 journal articles and conference papers with students. This exemplary of her commitment to scholarship and teaching as she strives to enhance the quality and experiences 
of the Learning for All is the reason she is the recipient of the Distinguished Undergraduate Mentoring Award. Christine. Each year it has seemed fitting for a faculty honors convocation for me to ask a faculty member to, who's been being honored that year to share some perspectives they've gained on higher education. This year, since our selection committee found it absolutely impossible to choose between these two awardees, Felix and Christine, for the Distinguished Undergraduate Mentoring Awards, I decided it was a perfect time to ask them both to speak. So instead of giving out one award this year, we're giving out two in this category and for very wonderfully deserving faculty members. So I asked them to present to us today on their perspective of higher education at this point in their careers with the perspective of student mentoring in mind. So please welcome them over here to this side of the stage, Felix and Christine, for their remarks. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk about something that both Felix and I feel incredibly passionately about. Um, undergraduate uh, research experience, experiences and mentoring these students. Um, throughout the slideshow, you'll see photographs of our um, former students for the most part. And it's very easy to distinguish the psychology students from the chemistry students. <laughs> the chemistry students are usually wearing the white lab coats and sometimes goggles. Um, my students tried to create some more fascinating photographs of themselves, but it didn't really, it didn't really work all that well. Um, however, uh, before being asked to uh, make this presentation, Felix and I actually had never met one another. And um, the thought of perhaps pulling together some sort of talk on mentoring that represented both of our, our mentoring philosophies seemed a daunting task until we sat down and started chatting with one another and saw in fact that there was an awful lot we happened to have in common with one another. And so what we decided to do for today is to talk a little bit about uh, the, the goals that we both share in common in terms of um, mentoring these undergraduate students. And we also decided to um, talk with our students, interview it very, very informally, and provide for you also some anecdotal evidence in support of some of the arguments that we're making that these are you know, accomplishments that students actually achieve during the time working in our laboratory. So I'm going to allow first Felix to tell you just a little bit about what student experiences are in his laboratory, and then I'll share with you a bit of what we do as well. Felix? Thank you very much, Christine. So what we're going to do it is we're going to go back and forth. You know, slide here, me, I talk about it, and then she's going to talk about the experience. And like she's right, you know, when we, talk, we talked about initially, how do we put these things together? She's in psychology, I'm in chemistry. But it was amazing to us to realize that at the end of the day, we had the same idea, the same goals for our students. So that was very good. Um, so the first uh, slide here is I'm going to talk about what happens in, in a research lab when students come to my lab. What, what do, they, do, do I expect from them? And what do they get at the end of the lab? My research is at the forefront of chemical biology and organometallic chemistry. Uh, we've been working in three areas of chemistry, uh, organic synthesis, bioorganic chemistry and computational chemistry. Um, the way I do my, uh, my, my research is I design specific projects for the students. I set clearly defined goals and expectations early on so the students know what is required of them. And I think it's essential for undergraduate research to do this because the students are already overburdened, if you will, with so many credits from their courses. So when you have research that's which is tailored with goals which are defined, then it makes the research experience less daunting for the undergraduate students. So basically, um, the students also are, are responsible to, to read the literature and to, you know, to know what's going on. What is, how do you relate what we are doing to what the entire uh, chemistry community is doing? Um, uh, we, 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 they learn the synthetic skills, they learn the um, uh, computational skills involved in their projects. And then also uh, analyze data, um, uh, I, I make sure we have weekly meetings where we get together and talk about 
Oh, okay. I didn't touch anything. I'm just making sure it wasn't my fault. <laughs> okay. So we have um, uh, weekly meetings where students, um, what we talk about, um, the project and then one on one, you know, just to encourage students um, uh, on the, the, the way the project, project is going. And then, uh, uh, of course, we assist the students in writing uh, conference presentations and um, if the research goes well, to also be able to write uh, manuscripts for, for, for publications. So I am a group dynamicist with a background in social psychology. Most of the students who find their way to my laboratory are in fact graduate school bound students interested in getting some research experience. Um, most of them have an interest in social psychology, but, but certainly not all of them. Um, one of the things that we do, I usually assemble a small group of students, maybe you know somewhere between four and six each um, year, each academic year, and we meet weekly. And essentially, we design the experiments that we'll be carrying out during the students' time in the laboratory. And the students also get an awful lot of experience actually creating stimulus materials and such, uh, the, the material essentially that the, the human subjects will respond to in our experiments. Um, we also obviously need to collect data from human participants. And this is a, a role that um, all of these undergraduate students assume. They also get an awful lot, probably far more than they ever would like, experience um, content coding conversations. Because I'm very, very interested in social influence processes, often we're asking questions like, why was this particular person influential in making a particular group decision? And so the students have to capture the um, human participants' interactions on uh, video recording equipment and then begin the tedious process of content coding them. If you ever see my students in the summertime, they're always the ones without a tan because they're in the basement of El Sabo Hall content coding their hearts out. And um, they, they generally, you know, uh, get very tired of that uh, before they leave. They also assist me in analyzing data, and of course they assist me in writing manuscripts and conference presentations. You know what, I, I went backwards, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so uh, Kristen and I have a very uh, strong passion for, for undergraduate research because we truly believe that it offers the, the best opportunity for students in their educational career. And we, we truly believe in this because we feel that the students we are having today are the future leaders. And the skills that they get from undergraduate research opportunities such as critical thinking, which can complement what they get from their coursework. Um, we believe that undergraduate research also can make the students to be more independent and be able to do things and be able to set goals for themselves. They can be able to learn interpersonal skills and communication skills through the research experience and so on. So what we do is that we think that um, it's rare if you go in a big department where you have graduate program, those students, um, not to knock down any, any, any particular university, but those students don't have the opportunity that students at Grand Valley do have. Uh, because we, have, um, no, we don't have graduate programs, at least in chemistry and psychology, as far as I know. Uh, the students are able to get that experience, which is what you can only get from graduate school. They're able to navigate through the research process. We, have, we think that we give them all that is necessary for them to be fully engaged in, the, in, in their project. And uh, we both see research, uh, our students, as what I call our collaborators or junior colleagues. Um, so it's, not, it's a relationship where it's not like I'm just going to tell you what to do, I just go in and do it. It's a back and forth thing, you know, um, what, is idea? what do you think about this? You know, go think about it, come talk to me about it. So it's a very good collaboration where we are colleagues and, you know, we, we work towards a common goal. So now we're going to share some, you know, some, um, some, some, from, uh, some citations or quotations from our students who've graduated. This one, this is uh, Jamie Gomez. Uh, she graduated from, from Grand Valley from my lab um, a year ago, and now she's a master's uh, slash PhD student at Western Michigan University. And she writes, uh, my research experience uh, completely changed my life and the way that I operated. I was required to work hard and learn all the skills I needed to be successful in the lab as well as in school. And you know, now she's doing very well in, um, at Western Michigan University. Um, the next one is uh, one of Christine's students. Um, he writes, you definitely, um, assume, 
uh, she's talking about Christine. Yeah. You definitely encouraged me, <laughs> of course. You definitely encouraged me to learn a lot about techniques that helped me later, in, later on in graduate school, like log linear and factor analysis. And in general, I learned a lot about research design. And so he's a graduate student in psychology at Wayne State University. The next one is still one of Christine's students. And she writes, the fact that GVSU doesn't have a graduate program in psychology also meant that I was able to spend a substantial amount of time working with faculty one-on-one. -on -one. Very important. This experience is very different from how many labs operate at Michigan State. I was treated more like a colleague than an undergraduate cog in a data collection machine. Melissa McDonald is a PhD candidate in psychology at Michigan State University. So you can see that we really rehearse this very well. <laughs> Go ahead. Another goal that Felix and I discovered that we had in common was in working with students, trying to instill in them the confidence necessary to move on to graduate school and, and uh, feel as though they could begin to work independently. And one of the very nice things about working with um, these students, especially for uh, multiple years, I often have students do two full years in my lab before they uh, go on to graduate school, is that they begin to think about uh, the independent projects that they can carry out without my supervision in many instances. And probably one of my favorite stories that really shows this in action are um, two of my very first um, undergraduate laboratory assistants, Tammy Niven and Amanda Dykema Inglade. Um, we had collected data for a project. It was just a small um, collection of pilot data for a project that ultimately ended up not working out very well. And of course, most of you know what you do with those data, right? They go on a shelf for a while and then they sh they're shredded. Um, but my students decided that it was such a pity because they saw some interesting things in those data that they could potentially write up as a paper. I wasn't terribly interested in it, but I said, have at it, go ahead, see if you can find something in the data. And they took it and independently analyzed it on their own and wrote a conference um, submission. Um, this was for um, an undergraduate portion of a regional conference, the Midwestern Psychological Association's meetings. They submitted their paper for a Psychi paper session, hoping that they would get a poster submission. That's how they wanted to do it, because they were young and inexperienced, and the thought of speaking in front of a lot of people seemed very, very scary for them. Um, but what they found out is that they had actually won the regional award. Their, their research that they had done was so phenomenal that they were chosen to be uh, celebrated at the conference and they had to give a talk. Um, <laughs> somehow it's coming back to me, right? <laughs> I have to give a talk today. Um, but uh, this photograph that I took of them was after they gave their talk. You can see the big smiles on their faces. They were quite, you know, pasty looking before with nervousness and so on. Um, but they did a delightful job and once again you can see um, in both of these young women, even while there were still students in the classroom, that sense of, I have a real ownership over the field of psychology spilling over into their coursework and so on. And that's truly one of the wonderful things to experience um, in uh, mentoring undergraduate students. Now, um, the first quote that we have from a student oh, consistent with this theme is a student of Felix's, Jillian, I hope I say her name correctly, Kupa Kawana. Oh, yay. Um, and she uh, states, research with Dr. Nagasa did more for my career, character, excuse me, as a developing scientist than any other experience in my undergraduate career. The experience of owning a project changed the lab experience. I wanted my experiments to work and was excited to analyze my purified products. Um, a student of mine who just last year went off to um, Iowa State University in the graduate program in psychology, Catherine Eidema, wrote, my experience working in a research lab as an undergraduate gave me what I perceived to be a major advantage in my first semester of graduate school, having already been exposed to study design, development, and implementation, I had the confidence to begin developing studies of my own right away. Another thing we found we had in common is that through our dedication and unyielding devotion to the undergraduate research experience, our students are motivated to make significant contribution 
in our different lab uh, projects. And this is shown you know, through tangible products as far as presentations and peer-reviewed uh, publications. Here you see um, uh, on the left, or on, on the left, my left right here, that's Eric Lindsay, one of my uh, uh, former research students who is now at the uh, University of North Carolina. That was in Chicago in 2007, where she, he was presenting his um, uh, research at the uh, National American Chemical Society meeting. Um, to the right, um, my right, the other one, that's, uh, those are three of Christine's students um, who were presenting also at the, um, uh, at the national, national conference. Some uh, students have perceptions of be benefits. Um, uh, Jamie Gomez writes, attending conferences is something that I now do yearly. Um, um, it was amazing that I got to experience this as an undergraduate junior year. I also got so much experience writing professionally. Um, one of Christine's students, I really benefited from having so many opportunities to write professionally. I was especially lucky to have a publication uh, before I even got to graduate school. Um, Amanda Dykema, uh, who, is a PhD, uh, who has a PhD now and is an assistant professor of psychology at North State University. The final goal that we'd like to talk about is probably one of the most important ones in terms of the student's ultimate success, and that is assisting them with navigating the very, very complex graduate application process. Um, this has changed a lot over the years since I've been mentoring students. It simply is much, much more difficult to get into graduate programs. I suspect the changing economy might have something to do with it. Um, and of course, there are always disappointments associated with you know, attempting on your first, uh, first year out to get into a graduate program and not, uh, not getting in. So um, clearly, you know, the, um, my, my labs are comprised of students of multiple years. And uh, this is a very useful thing for the more junior students to see the ones applying to graduate school, how complicated it is. It just really gives them a sense of how hard they're going to have to work in order to uh, achieve that particular goal. And while providing them, the students with research experiences, I think is critical in terms of making them very, very competitive for graduate school, that's only really a very small piece of what they need to do in order to successfully gain admittance. So I'll work with my students on multiple drafts of their personal statements. I'll assist them in choosing appropriate schools so they don't have too many competitive programs, so they're not being too cautious in terms of their applications and so on. And I think that um, you know, this process works quite well. Between uh, the two of us, Felix and me, we have sent 40 students on to graduate programs over the course of both of our careers. And we've been talking for a while about what we perceive to be the benefits for the students, but obviously there have to be some wonderfully rewarding uh, benefits for us. And I think one of the most rewarding aspects of this component of my job is simply watching those junior colleagues ultimately become my genuine colleagues. As a matter of fact, these are three young women who have um, graduated from PhD programs and who are currently uh, in faculty positions at uh, various universities. Amanda Dykema Inglade, as a matter of fact, just uh, spoke with me last evening and said that she was, in fact, awarded tenure. Uh, she didn't want me to change her title there. She thought I would jinx it. I guess the provost hasn't <laughs> given the approval yet. So we'll just continue to call her an assistant professor until it's official. Um, but she was extremely excited about that. Angela Walker is um, also an assistant professor, and she actually has um, done a lot of research on um, mentoring and uh, was inspired, in fact, by uh, thinking about mentors and so on, starting in, in my laboratory and moving on to graduate school. And Jennifer Spore is also an assistant professor at La Trobe University. Uh, so this is a, a, an incredibly rewarding component of my job, getting to share in um, you know, the lives of these uh, very impressive young people, uh, being able to see them achieve the goal that they set out to achieve when I very first met them. And yes, Christine, you're absolutely right. I mean, this, um, the students' uh, products, which you can already quantify as far as the research is concerned, yes, we're happy with you know, tangible products, getting a publication, going to presentations, and so on. But just the reward or you know, the joy you get seeing your students succeed in life, it's amazing. I want to talk a little bit about Jillian, because I think this is a story of, of resilience. This is somebody, I think that with determination and perseverance, you can actually turn dreams to reality. 
Jillian originally came to, to us, to Grand Valley, from uh, GRCC, and prior to that, and she had come all the way from her native land of Zimbabwe. And when she came um, to Grand Rapids area for the first time, she was a Rotary uh, Fellow in high school, so she did high school here in the Grand Rapids area. When she went back to Zimbabwe, um, she liked it so much that she had to come back to GRCC to go to college. And then when she transferred to Grand Valley, um, we walk in the hallway one day and then she bumped into me, a fellow African, I, I suppose, and she was like, oh, Professor Ngaisa, you know, do you have time? I can stop by the office and talk to you about, about my, my schedule, my, you know, my career, and so I said, absolutely, just like we all do, um, all of us faculty at Grand Valley. So she came in, we sat down, we're talking. And she was telling me, oh, I, I'm lost, I'm this, and all this, I said, okay, calm down. You know, back and forth, we talked for a while, and she said, I am interested in doing research on HIV AIDS, because it's something that's affected a lot of people where she's from. And I'm like, okay, that's a great idea. Um, how do you see this going? Um, she said, oh, I want to go to medical school. Wait a second, you want to go to medical school? That's a great idea. Have you thought about maybe going to do a PhD, maybe? She said, well, you know, I want to go to medical school. I said, that's okay, fine. Um, get these papers, read these papers, and you know, let's, let's talk about some more next time. Um, back and forth about a week, and she came back and said, well, I think you know, I want to try and see if I really like research. She registered in my lab the following semester, started doing research. Uh, she liked it so much that she got an internship at AutoCore the summer of that same year. Um, she did so well that she presented her research at the National Conference in San Diego. And after that experience, she came back and told me it completely changed her life. Um, now, she had one impediment. Um, going to medical school as a, um, as a foreign student is, is almost uh, impossible because you cannot get loans to pay for medical school. And I told her, well, what you can do, the other way you can do this is go to graduate school. The secret you don't know about graduate school is that you're going to be paid to go to school. Just try graduate school. <laughs> so, she listened and you know, she applied a helper through the process. She took the GRE, did very well in the GRE, and got into Syracuse. Um, you know, we've, been, we've been in touch all the time. And last summer, uh, she sent me this, this email. Actually, before last summer, she sent me an email. I am still interested to go to medical school. Would you mind writing uh, letters of recommendations for me? Absolutely, I will. I did. I wrote the letters of recommendation. She defended her PhD last year, got her PhD and got a full scholarship to Columbia University Medical School. So it is, it is an amazing story. And I think, you know, what I'm saying here is that what, I've, what we have shared with you guys is pretty much um, the same. I, I mean, I'll bet for all of our colleagues at Grand Valley that the experience that we have in supervising students in, in, in research, you know, it's what we all like to do. Now, it, there are certain factors for each of us as, as faculty that this experience may, may depend on. For example, how many students you do have as, as, as students that you mentor? Um, what is the nature of the relationship or the collaboration between you and your students? How much time is spent you know, um, in that research, research collaboration? Also, do you have any tangible products, presentations, uh, publications? It is good, but the most important thing are the students, which you cannot really quantify. And lastly, of course, how supportive is the administration as far as the research is concerned? And to that end, about the administration, in my humble opinion, I think we feel we are very lucky to belong to an institution where the highest academic rank, the president, the provost, and the deans, are very supportive of undergraduate research. That's something that we should be very thankful about. Our students have written to us all these, these uh, quotation, quotations that we have are just a few of the many that we have. And everything is reflected in the fact that Grand Valley is a place to be because of the opportunity it gives to students. And it's something that they wouldn't, wouldn't have otherwise got if they went somewhere else. So we're very, um, uh, we're very uh, appreciative of that. So on behalf of uh, Christine and I, um, we would like to congratulate all the other award recipients. And also, we'd like to thank the CSCE uh, for bestowing this award on us. Um, um, uh, we also like to acknowledge everyone, all the mentors in the audience, because we feel that this award we're getting is also an award for you guys, it's for all, all of us. And we feel that, or we hope that, you feel the same gratification in celebrating this award and the role that mentoring plays in our educational system. And to all of you, thank you very much.
Thank you so much for that presentation, both of you, Felix and Christine. It's uh, very much food for thought. Those relationships with students sometimes last a lifetime. But for absolute sure, the influence of the mentor and mentee certainly does last forever. It's a fabulous part of our work. Very nice. Let's move on to another group of awards. Next are the Pew Excellence Awards. And I'd like to ask Dr. Christine Renner to come up for um, presentation of those awards. Christine is doing an absolutely outstanding job leading the Pew Faculty Teaching and Learning Center. I am so happy that we have such an active, vibrant center of support for our faculty and that it's so well used. We are always adding new and exciting programs, being data-based in our decisions about directions for the center, and just so skillfully led. Thank you, Christine, very much. Will the Pew Excellence Award winners please join me on stage? There is no one true path to teaching excellence. There are many ways, and we're very excited to have this group um, of award winners this year, which re really represent um, a diverse uh, ways of teaching and ways of knowing and varying disciplines as well. Our first award, the Pew Teaching Excellence Award for part-time faculty goes to Justin Pettibone, Liberal Studies. Will you please join me? The creation of deep learning experiences through service learning requires time, energy, creativity, and an alliance with students. Justin is actively engaged in many projects that assist students in, in civic engagement, and he sets an example for the rest of us in how to lead students towards critical th thinking uh, through service learning. This level of commitment to teaching is recognized and valued at Grand Valley. Thank you and congratulations. Today we are pleased to give Dr. Amy Schelling the Pew Teaching with Technology Award. She is well known for her skill in assistive technology, videos, and podcasting. She trains and mentors other faculty as well. We could all benefit from her knowledge in the learning that comes with online community building. She is a leader in creating and sharing technological advances in technology. Congratulations, Amy. I am pleased to recognize Dr. Nathan Barrows as a 2012 Pew Teaching Excellence Award winner. He is well known not only for his academic rigor in chemistry, but also for his passion for students. He is able to maintain the delicate balance, which includes a focus on student engagement and teaching excellence in the midst of scientific complexity. Students praise him consistently, citing their own lessons learned even when they don't come easily. Faculty concur, and we're delighted to celebrate your achievements with this award. Alice, please join me. <laughs> Creativity, energy, and deep experiences inside and outside of the classroom are part of what contributes to the teaching excellence of Dr. Alice Chapman. Using experiential learning across history and liberal arts to learn more about the Middle Ages leaves an indelible mark with students that affects their coursework and their university life. We are pleased to celebrate your accomplishments by honoring you with a Pew Teaching Excellence Award this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are pleased today to commend Professor Maria Landon from the Seidman College of Business on her Pew Teaching Excellence Award. Consistently, with energy and passion, she is able to bring her vast experience to GVSU students, challenging them and creating relationships with them so that they enter the business world equipped and invigorated for their own professional development. Congratulations, Maria.
Dr. Michelle Miller-Adams. Dr. Miller-Adams' capacity to transport knowledge gained in the world of research analysis and from her role as consultant and program director is an exceptional gift to undergraduate students in political science and to Grand Valley State University. Assisting students in their studies to become more curious, better thinkers, and engaged citizens in global affairs is a substantial contribution to today's society. Congratulations, Dr. Miller-Adams, on this 2012 Teaching Excellence Award. Dr. Kirsten Strom. Congratulations to Dr. Kirsten Strom, Associate Professor of Art History, for her Teaching Excellence Award. When residents of Grand Rapids or citizens of Michigan consider educational opportunities at Grand Valley State, they may not be immediately aware of professors like Dr. Strom, who specialize in design, surrealism, and political culture. Using art and its history as a way to know and understand culture requires vast knowledge across more than one discipline. Helping students develop the ability to be independent thinkers is a hallmark of great teachers. Thank you, Dr. Strom, for your teaching excellence in doing both of these things well. Dr. Richard Valerie of the Physics Department is awarded a Pew Teaching Excellence Award today because like those who have been honored before him, he understands and practices the important value and skill of active, engaged teaching for students. By inviting his students to go beyond lectures and actually do physics, he helps them apply physics to their discipline. Dr. Valerie devotes time and energy to the classroom, student organizations, and the Science Olympiad. It is an honor to give him this award. Congratulations. Thank you to all the winners. Wonderful selections. Thank you, Bob and Christine, for these last two collections of wonderful awards. Thanks. What could be better with all this evidence of faculty expertise and relationship with students than to be able to showcase some of our very best success stories, our students? We see the results of strong faculty work on our students' learning all the time. And it's become a tradition at these events to be able to showcase students from our performing arts area. So today, I'd like to welcome Professor Dale Schremer to the podium and our students to the stage soon. I am very excited to present these two lovely young talents to you. Uh, Lene Myers and Claire Chardon. I also like to acknowledge the wonderful musical contributions of James Barnett, who comes to us from Chicago and spent the month of January and part of February being the vocal coach, rehearsal pianist, and conductor for the upcoming production of The Light in the Piazza. The Light in the Piazza is the excerpts that you'll see today, and it's based on an Elizabeth Spencer novella called The Light in the Piazza. And there was a 1960s film with Olivia de Havilland and Rosanna Brazzi that some of you might know, which is the same story. Uh, two Americans, Margaret and Clara, go to Florence to revisit the place where Margaret and Roy honeymooned 30 years ago. Clara meets the young Italian Fabrizio Naccarelli, and they fall in love. Part of the magic of the story is that Fabrizio's English is not good. Clara's Italian is bad. But they still manage to communicate their affection. And the story is very emotionally complex. But in the end, Margaret tells Clara, love. Love, love, if you can, oh my Clara, as the story reaches its denouement. 
Love if you can and be loved. So the music of the light in the piazza is the oxygen of love. This is not exactly a new idea in musical theater history, but in these circumstances becomes a stunning revelation in all its innocence, its passion, as if no one had ever thought of singing about this before. Today, we'll hear the opening duet of Margaret and Clara as they begin their first day of sightseeing in Florence, and then Clara's beautiful song describing how she is experiencing this love that is growing within her. We open Friday night. <laughs> there are little postcards on the table out in the lobby when you go for your refreshments. I would encourage you to take one and come see these beautiful kids. So without further ado, the light in the piazza. Oh, 
isn't that wonderful? Remember, their production is coming up. <laughs> Don't miss the chance to hear more. Thank you very much, Dale. That was fabulous. Okay. And now we come to our last group of awards, the University Awards for Excellence in Advising, Service, Scholarship, and Teaching. Will those receiving these University Awards of Excellence please come up on stage as the others have done? President Haas. Everyone squeaks walking across this floor. The Outstanding Academic Advising and Student Services Award is presented to Dr. Deborah Berg. Would you please come forward? <laughs> Dr. Berg is Professor of Biomed Sciences and joined Grand Valley in 1999. A graduate of Hope College with a PhD from the University of Iowa, Dr. Burke has pursued her interest in cancer research and teaching. But as the program notes reveal, she has also excelled as an academic advisor and mentor to Grand Valley students. Even before she came to Grand Valley, Dr. Burke's philosophy of advising was clear. Too often, she wrote, meetings with advisors consist only of signing registration forms and seeing that required courses have been taken. A more personal discussion better meets the student's needs over the long run and results in a satisfied graduate who will retain an interest in the school long after leaving. The perfect message. Congratulations. <laughs> Associate Professor of Psychology, Dr. Amy Matthews. Amy is the recipient of this year's Outstanding Community Service Award. Since Dr. Matthews joined Grand Valley in 1998, she has served the community through her excellent work in the area of autism spectrum disorder. The rippling effect of her work through START and ACE is explained in your program notes. Put briefly, her work has touched parents, educators, and professionals as they work with their children with autism, these across the state and beyond. While some who are newly hired struggle at first with their scholarly agenda, Amy was well prepared in this area when she got here. Prior to coming to Grand Valley, she completed a postdoctoral internship at Schneider Children's Hospital in New Hyde Park, New York, and a postdoc fellowship at the Children's Health Council in Palo Alto. Those and other experiences and a dissertation on the social behavior and imitation in children with autism prepared her well to become the acknowledged leader in her field that she is now. Congratulations. <laughs> this year's Outstanding University Service Award is presented to Dr. Kathleen Underwood who joined Grand Valley in 2003 and is a tenured associate professor. Yay for you. She holds a joint appointment in class and the Brooks College. A former colleague describes her simply as a joiner and a motivator. And in fact, she is one of those rare people who is able to see opportunities for improvement when others see only difficulties. In addition to what's mentioned about her work in your program, she was the co-project director for the National Science Foundation, GVSU, University of Michigan partnership called Advancing Women in Science and Engineering Award. That's a mouthful. She is also well published, including a number of articles, a monograph titled Town Building on the Colorado Frontier, and a textbook for middle school students that she co-authored. She was the recipient of two fellowships from the Spencer Foundation, 
coordinated National History Day in Texas, and that's a big state, <laughs> and once undertook a personal car odyssey in pursuit of the route of Lewis and Clark's historic journey. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Kathy. Dr. Paul Jorgensen, Professor of Computing and Information Systems, is this year's recipient of the Distinguished Contribution in a Discipline Award. He came to Grand Valley in 1988. Over the course of his career, Professor Jorgensen has steadily contributed to the field of software and electronics. His magnum opus, his book Software Tus Testing, A Craftsman's Approach, currently is in its third edition. It's been published in multiple languages, adopted by over 50 universities, and is available in more than 10 countries. It is considered one of the very top books on software testing available anywhere in the world. Paul's reputation of excellence in his field is grounded in his multifaceted contributions, both in scholarship as he has had an impressive list of publications in the most respected journals, and in service to the discipline as he continues to serve on various standard groups, professional societies, and on the International Software Testing Qualification Board. Paul is an exemplary instructor, scholar, and mentor. It is with great pleasure that I recognize Paul Jorgensen's contributions not only to Grand Valley, but to the broader world by awarding him the Distinguished Contribution in a Discipline Award. Today's last award is for the University Outstanding Teacher, this year presented to Dr. David Austin, professor of mathematics who has been at Grand Valley since 1999. Yes, please, let's clap. <laughs> It is important to note that his intellect and expertise in mathematics is only part of the winning equation here. <laughs> David is distinguished beyond traditional academic abilities. He perceives his service to students and colleagues as part of his teaching. He graciously shares his innovations in mathematics education for the benefit of all. David keeps his classes current with contemporary applications. For instance, he has brought mathematics to his students by using algorithms for Google page ranking and JPEG compression algorithms. His excellent record of student-centered teaching is matched with his scholarly work, including academic publications, editorial work, as well as monthly feature writing for the American Mathematical Society. He also serves on numerous committees guiding curriculum at Grand Valley. He developed a course for physics, I'm sorry, a course for physics students that addresses mathematics for the physical sciences. He supports and supervises student research and is absolutely committed to fostering curiosity and achievement in his students. Congratulations for all this, David. Does the heart good, doesn't it? All this accomplishment, all these wonderful people. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> this is the conclusion of our convocation. Um, I want to thank the GVSU Brass Quintet over here for your beginning and now pretty soon ending of our event here. Wonderful music today. Thank you again to our student performers who I think are too far behind the curtain to take a bow, but give them our gratitude. <laughs> Most especially, thanks to all of you for coming. I hope you're able to stay for a little bit. We have a reception out in the exhibition hall in just a minute. As soon as we get out there, I'm sure food is waiting. So please 
stick around if you can to congratulate our awardees this evening and enjoy conversation with the colleagues around you. Thank you very much. I, I would ask that you would please remain seated while we process back out of the auditorium and we'll see you outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.